So um, I chose to talk about uh, provisionals. Um, if you ask my students at King's, they will all tell you that, yeah, he's paranoid. He doesn't let us to call them temps, which is what everyone calls them. So uh, if you just call them temps, it devalues them. It likes make it sound like something not that important. So um, in my opinion, all kind of temps are provisionals. Whatever goes on teeth between preparation and fitting is a provisional. So um, why? Did I pick this uh, topic because it's a topic that um, uh, frustrated me. Um, actually, I did my BDS back at the Royal London, well, it's Queen Mary uh, nowadays, and prose was a very badly taught subject. I didn't understand it at all, but I'm the type of person. Um, who responds by throwing more at it if I, if I don't quite get it. So I decided to do a whole specialty training on it <laughs> as a reaction to that. And um, in my early years, provisionals, temporaries, if you will, were a little bit um, uh, frustrating. But with uh, some training, I just uh, learned how to make them fun. So um, I did quite a bit of training in the States, uh, apart from my uh, MCLIN dent at uh, King's. So I followed Spear Education, which is um, a big teaching institution in, uh, in America where they go into a lot of depth and I learn techniques and materials on how to enjoy this. So I'm going to share some of the ideas about provisionals, even at undergrad uh, level. What I want to cover first um, is uh, something, actually, now that I think about it, uh, the topic of provisionals could easily be a final year's question. Uh, for, for undergrads or a fourth year question. So uh, the first part that I want to cover is the value of provisionals, the functions of them, what, what's all the fuss. So the biggest one is obviously to cover the prepared teeth. On this picture, we can see four crown preparations and uh, the patient wouldn't really fancy going away like this. Forget the aesthetic aspect. The two middle teeth are vital, the lateral incisors are not, so uh, we need some sort of thermal and bacterial protection, otherwise they're all going to go non-vital. So well-fitting provisionals will uh, protect exposed dentin. We tend to use zinc oxide eugenol, ZOE, um, in our temporary cements like Tempond. And the eugenol part of uh, Tembond has uh, bacteriostatic properties, so it will protect against bacteria. So that's one of the functions. Oops, pardon me. The second function is that we do need our teeth to eat after all. So if you take this case that I showed earlier with the four incisors, even if they were non-vital teeth and you forget about bacterial insulation, what's the patient going to eat with? So um, I had uh, a lower right six crowned about a year ago. And uh, when the temporary came off, then I was kind of having to think of how I'm going to eat. So even in a fully dentate mouth, um, for a single tooth, a provisional is important. This is my little boy, he's uh, five years old. So I use that picture to illustrate the, <laughs> the point of function. Um, another uh, very important function of provisionals has to do with the periodontal health. So here, this could be a topic on its own. I could talk for about an hour just on this, but um, well-fitting provisionals will maintain or improve periodontal health by having good cleansability. So to make it more clear, these pictures at the bottom, they show um, 
some uh, uh, ceramics we have just been removed. So it's a repeat case, which is something I get to do a lot as a specialist. So I removed the previous restorations to find that the tissues were a bit all over the place. The picture on the right is uh, how the tissues looked two weeks after. So I put my provisionals, which were cleansable, in terms of embrasure and interdental space, and look what the body does. All it needs is um, uh, the right shape, and interdental brushes will do the rest. Some of you may have done some uh, single crowns or about to do. <coughs> you will all uh, come uh, into uh, face the situation where you will see some gingival overgrowth. So if you think of a single crown, let's say a lower molar, and the provisional doesn't fit very well on the day of fitting, there might be a lump of uh, excess tissue over the margin. That overgrowth happens because of a poor provisional, and that is gonna mess around with your cementation process. The last aspect of uh, perio and provisionals is that it helps to capture data. What do I mean? That uh, at some point I'm going to have to take either an impression or a scan of uh, these uh, teeth on the bottom right picture to get new restorations made. So for those who have done even a single crown, you will see the point that it's a million times easier to capture an impression of the teeth on the right than the teeth on the left. You don't want to be fighting with blood because it's a messy, messy job. Another aspect of provisionals has to do with shaping tissues. So I don't have the full flow of pictures here because I wanted to keep it to about an hour of talking today, but this is a three unit bridge, the canine, and the uh, second premolar were prepared for a three unit bridge, and there is a concavity uh, on the pontic side. This was actually formed by the provisional by adding and subtracting on the base of the pontic to create what we call an ovate pontic, uh, a bullet like type pontic, which is going to be emerging from the tissue like a tooth, as opposed to a ridge lap, which is the opposite. Another function of the provisionals has to do with occlusal stability. And uh, this is something you will all face in your careers where teeth move between preparation and cementation. What do I mean? Uh, if you look at this premolar, uh, the first premolar, the provisional on it is not touching with a canine on the mesial aspect. So what it allows the tooth to do is to drift mesially. That means that when a few weeks afterwards you go ahead and take out your provisional to put your final crown, whatever that is, the teeth have moved. So you don't have the same situation as you do on the models. And that uh, is a, something that the provisionals can prevent. So having good proximal contacts with both adjacent teeth as well as a solid occlusal contact will prevent drifting off the adjacent teeth and the opposing one. In other words, keep the tooth where it is. One more aspect of the provisionals has to do with phonetics and lip dynamics. This is not something you will probably come across in your undergraduate years, but uh, the more complex cases you do, you may find that uh, with the prosthetic work, uh, you can change somebody's speech, which has to do with the horizontal relationship of teeth, the overjet. And uh, also, if the uh, teeth are positioned too far labial, and uh, they sit on the dry part of the lip as opposed to the wet part of the lip, that is something that the patients feel. And planning this on provisionals is the right stage. Another biggie in terms of uh, values or provisionals has to do with aesthetic uh, planning. 
So lots of uh, patients will request treatment for cosmetic reasons, or even if it's functional treatment, they want it to look good. So planning the incisor ledge, occlusal plane, tooth dimensions, proportion. By proportions, I mean the relationship between the width of the tooth to the length, which is usually about 75 to 80 percent. Uh, all these can be planned on the provisionals, even the shape. So I always get the patient to approve things on my provisionals so that I avoid unpleasant surprises afterwards. So uh, it is easy to copy the verified provisionals um, into the finals. This is something that has to do with communication with the technician and it avoids the patient's uh, having any unpleasant surprises, as I said. This ideally should be done on the mock-up, um, and I will explain a little bit later on what a mock-up is. It's like a test drive. So this uh, lady came to me with uh, a provisional placed on her upper right one. She came from the endodontist. She had some endo treatment on the central incisor. The endodontist placed a quick temporary and she came to me for the final restoration. I placed my provisional. I tried to mirror image the left incisor to the best of my ability. And then I took impressions of these. I gave a model to my technician and I asked them to replicate that shape for the final restoration. A little bit more on the aesthetic diagnostics. Uh, this lady needed, wanted rather, some aesthetic improvement. She had two ceramics on her central incisors. The concern was the uneven incisor ledges and the black triangle. If you notice, you can see that the lateral incisors are not actually even. So it was not possible to level the centrals in relation to the laterals just because the laterals were not symmetrical. So there had to be a compromise somewhere. I put her on a couple of temporaries, professionals, uh, in order to discuss with her where we're going with this. So I kept the left upper left one a tad longer than the upper right one, just because that lateral was a bit longer. And uh, I told her this is probably the best we're going to get. Is that okay with you? Which it was. She approved it. Um, and we moved on to the final restorations, which were blending in with her laterals without having a big step. There was a tiny uh, step between the incisor ledges. So all the planning was done on provisionals. One final. Uh, uh, function of provisionals has to do with uh, assessing the clearance that you provide. So when we're planning for veneers, crowns, onlays, any indirect restorations, the thickness of the provisional is a reflection of how much we have prepared. And that leads me up to another topic which has to do with when you're preparing for a single tooth, do you guys get to make your provisionals first or take the impression first? What comes first? So what I actually teach at King's is different to what I do uh, because I always get my students, undergrads and postgrads to make the provisionals first. Why? Because it ensures that the patient will leave with something solid. If you focus fully on the impression taking, you may not have any time for the provisional it's 12.30, the nurses are running after you and you have nothing to put on the tooth. So I always ask my students to make the provisional first, bank it on the side, and if there's any time left, have a go at taking impressions. What I actually do is the opposite because uh, I don't want all the B-sacral composite, all the flush that comes from it to get trapped in between teeth and mess around with my impression. So I actually take impressions first. But the provisionals can give you an idea of the thickness. If you have a look at this upper left one, you can see that it's very see-through. It's very thin. So in that area, 
it tells me that I haven't prepared enough. And one can use this Ivanson gauge, which measures the thickness. So if you're planning for a metal ceramic crown, which should be about 1.2 to 1.5 on the facial, and you use that gauge in that area, you're gonna find about, I don't know, five tenths of a millimeter, seven tenths, you know that you have underprepared. Many years ago, I was told that, hey, never make pretty temporaries because it's gonna make the final look better. And I said, no, 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 hang on a second. I don't like this idea, okay? It uh, lowers the expectations of putting on an ugly temp, but uh, I never followed this concept. So I always aim for um, very good provisionals because of all the reasons that I just explained. Uh, the problem with that, I mean, the good thing about it is that it will excite the patient. It will reassure them. It will make the patient feel that, hang on a second, that person knows what they're doing. Uh, and uh, if you've got super duper provisional tube, it's always a safety net if you need to go back to them. The downside is that it raises expectations. So if you have super duper temps, then the patient is expecting at least that, if not better. But that, I see it as a driver for me to get better. So I aim for very good provisional restorations, whether it's a single tooth or multiple. Um, and then I expect very high standards from my technician and myself for the final restoration. That picture at the bottom is not an example of an excellent provisional, on the contrary, it's a, it's a funny story. Uh, I was asking my nurse in practice for an A3 provisional uh, material, a bisacral composite, and she told me, listen, we've run out. Um, we've only got B1. I said, are you kidding me? Um, so I had to use a B1. So I shaped it well, I polished it, I glazed it, but it was about four shades off. So I explained to the guy that, listen, buddy, I'm going to give you this. I apologize. It's, it's a mistake, but uh, that's all I've got on the day. So um, didn't make me look very cool. Let's talk a little bit materials. Um, there have been several over the years. I don't want to spend too much time on this. I'll quickly go through them in the 80s and 90s. Some people still use them quite a bit. Uh, methyl methacrylate acrylics, powder and liquid acrylics basically were used a lot. Because of the high exotherm on setting, they were really uh, frying the pulp. Um, ethyl methacrylates came out, which had less exotherm, but same family, it's like a cousin of the PMMA. Uh, then, in about 15 years ago, bisacryl composites came out. What we use at Guys is a material called Integrity, which is a type of bisacryl. Other common brands include ProTemp or Luxatemp, and they have dominated the market because they're easy to use. They can be uh, self cued composites. It's like a two tube uh, system similar to the bisacryl, but it's not a bisacryl as such, it's a genuine composite. And the brand name is Luxocrown. Alternatively, you can have light cured resin, just like your restorative composites, um, or milled resins. By milled, I mean it's uh, using CAD CAM technology which involves designing it on a software, and then a milling unit will cut it from a block of uh, composite or polymethyl methacrylate. And one brand name is TeleoCAD from Ivocla. Final option for materials can be used for braxis, for people who clench and grind the teeth heavily, and we need stronger substrates. So there is a metal, coping just like a metal ceramic crown but instead of porcelain baked on top you layer acrylic powder and liquid or composites so some cases may need provisionals for six months because of implant surgery or crown lengthening or other reasons and uh, these are stronger provisional materials a little bit more about some of them the more classical materials, powder and liquid ceramics, look something like this. 
most of you will probably never use them, but there are some purists which get excellent results with these. They are more uh, labor intensive, they need more time, but they work very well. So the more modern materials are something like uh, the bees acryls. So uh, Protemp is a very popular one. The one I prefer to use is called Luxatemp um, from DMG and uh, is uh, the bees acryl composite. The powder and liquids, which is the PMMA I just mentioned, they are quite cheap because it's just a powder and liquid, it's not that expensive. They have very good rigidity. They are stronger than bees acryl. Um, easy to repair. Downside is that they've got the acrylic monomer smell, so they stick off monomer and they shrink a lot. So there's a good 15% shrinkage. The exotherm is quite significant. If you've ever played with these, you will feel it's basically what dentures are made from, uh, PMMA. There is a lot of exotherm um, and they can discolor. The base acryl, on the other hand, they have very low shrinkage. So restorative composites, what you guys use for your routine restorative dentistry, they, these materials have uh, a shrinkage of about 3 to 4%, um, which is pretty low. It's not zero, but it's almost negligible. The base acryls don't have any odor. They retain the color stability quite well. Repairing wise, they're not great, but they're okay. So you can um, add uh, composites to them. But because it's in a, uh, in a two tube system, they will always have bubbles in them. So um, I always end up having some bubbles in my professionals. They're not the strongest, so they're a bit brittle. It's a bit more costly than the acrylics, which is the powder and liquid. But for single uh, tooth cases or small cases, they work beautifully. So 95% um, of dentists, I think, work with these acryl materials for their provisionals. So how do we actually use them? There's a few techniques. So the picture on the right shows a base acryl temporary crown on an upper central incisor made from a, a silicon index. That's the direct technique. You prep the tooth, you have a pre-op index, you fill that up with your base acryl, squeeze it down, and your provisional is done. Another technique is to actually make them on a model um, so it's not done there and then, it's done um, separately in, uh, in a laboratory. So these um, is a five unit <clears throat> PMMA bridge, polymethyl methacrylate, lab made, which was placed in, which was used for some six months while there was some integration of dental implants, the purple and yellow shiny metal bits are healing abutments for dental implants. So that was in place for a good six months. There's a combo technique, the shell temporary technique, um, which I will touch a little bit, but I would advise you to look it up because it's a, a bit of a combo of the two techniques I just mentioned. More recently, there have been um, products like these ones. You open up a little box and you have a molar which is hollowed out and then you reline this <clears throat> and make it kind of fit. You add, you subtract, but it's got the morphology of it. Uh, I never liked this idea because the, the amount of work that I have to do to modify this is more than the direct technique I just mentioned from a pre-op index. As far as the direct technique, which is how I'm assuming you guys are making your provisionals at a university for your first crown, for example. So you need some sort of a matrix. You need that matrix from either um, intraorally <clears throat> of how the tooth is beforehand or from a model. Um, so you think of how the tooth needs to be, you take it to the full morphology, to the full contour, and take an index of that. That is what I call the temp guide. 
um, the, the, the index used for making of the temporary. This can be either uh, transparent, clear, if you want to cure through it with the curing light, or it can be polyvinyl siloxane, a putty matrix, for example, or alginate for chemically cured materials. The more accurate the matrix, oops, pardon me, the more accurate the matrix, the better the provisional. So if you're crowning an upper central incisor and you take a pre-op index of that central, the more detail you have with uh, the matrix going into the embrasures, the less adjustments you will need to do on your provisionals. For that reason, I tend to use light body silicon when I take my pre-op index. Other materials that can be used to get a matrix is alginate or PVS, which stands for silicones, or even a sat down splint, like an Essex retainer. But um, why don't I use alginate for my matrix? I will explain. So imagine you're doing a single temporary crown. Lower right six, you prepared it, your tutor has approved it, beautiful prep. You have used your alginate impression that you've done beforehand, the pre-op, and you've made your provisional. You cement that and happy days. But a week after, your patient breaks that provisional. They bite on an olive stone or something. If you rely on an alginate, you will not have the ability to easily make a new provisional for them. Alginate is not dimensionally stable. It's not going to keep its shape after five days. It shrinks um, in, in absence of water or swells up in the presence of water. So I always do my patty matrix, my temp guide in silicon because the silicon, if you leave it for years, it's not going to change shape. So I can make multiple provisionals at any given time. The setting of, uh, com of uh, acrylics and bisacryl composite is an exothermic reaction. And the one thing that I remember from my A-level physics is that if you throw heat at an exothermic reaction, you speed it up. So what I do with my bisacryls, my temporaries, is I uh, put them in hot water straight after the bin in the mouth, and that speeds up the setting. It doesn't make it set better, it just makes it set faster. You may have covered in some seminars the concept of oxygen inhibited layer. Composites will not set equally well on the surface as further uh, deep. That because uh, the oxygen will prevent the surface from polymerizing well. So it's a sticky superficial layer and that can um, uh, get things a little bit messy. So I actually use some an alcohol solvent to remove, the, to remove that sticky uh, surface layer. But this is something you will come across um, in the next few years. What I actually use, and I will go through some uh, pictures of the bits that I use, I use discs to modify my provisionals, um, like Softlex discs. Uh, I will use some fine diamond burrs. By fine, I mean the yellow band ones, which is 30 micron grit. I will use some rubber wheels, like the ones we have at uh, Guy's Hospital is the Enhance um, rubber point, um, and some nylon brushes, which I will show you, and finally some glaze. So quite a few steps. I'm a little bit particular in my sequencing of these things. It does take a bit of time but uh, I will uh, go through the value of each one. As far as the indirects are concerned, um, not the direct technique, the ones that are made in the lab, uh, this uh, can be made through <coughs> um, in, in, in a lab setting um, on a stone or silicon model. They are primarily needed for long-term temporaries. So it's not the majority of work that we get to do. 
and uh, if we want stronger temporaries for a longer period we can use lab made provisionals which can be made from a scan a digital scan an optical scan or a, or a conventional impression the shell technique just to quickly go through it um, imagine a combination of the two so you look at the bottom left picture what the technician has done is uh, they have actually prepared the teeth like a trial prep they have mimicked what the dentist will be doing so they have shrunk the teeth down and uh, by using the patty index which is uh, the blue bit they will be able to make some rough kind of uh, temporaries which is called a shell and that is then relined in the mouth as you can imagine the way the technician will prep the tooth is never going to be the same with the way that you are going to prep the tooth so it's an approximation but they give you the outer eggshell which is hard pmma material highly polished and then all you do is you reline it um, with something runny so that it fits well um, it's again quite a time consuming process this is used for bigger reconstructions and extensive cases as i said before i like using the provisionals as a diagnostic measure and uh, i will ask my technician to copy the shape of the provisionals and the length to the final restoration so the picture on the bottom right shows you ceramics the final ceramics on the upper right one and two and provisionals on the upper left one and two so i had verified provisionals but what the lab did not do and probably was my mistake is they did not um, uh, copy the length so they gave me ceramics which were actually shorter than the ones i had anticipated so if you use digital calipers like the one on the left you can um, measure the length of your provisionals to the second decimal place and give an actual measurement to the lab the typical length of a central incisor is just over 10 millimeters and um, i will record it with the calipers and i will ask the technician for exactly a replica of my temporary sometimes it doesn't go that well though as you can see on the right picture let me put all of this into context and quickly go through a case this lady wanted as an aesthetic improvement of her teeth what worried her is the upper left one being shorter than the upper right one and the upper left two which was very skinny and chipped so she wanted a bit of symmetry basically she asked me whatever i have on the upper right one and two um, i want it mirror imaged onto these two teeth well as you can imagine i cannot magically make this tooth wider unless i do orthodontics so what i did is i did a mock-up so let me explain what the mock-up is so the top picture shows you the pre-op and uh, i took freehand um, I took um, a resin composite, restorative composite, and I shaped it onto her teeth. But it was unbonded. There was no edge, there was no unfilled resin. I was just mucking about, trying to get the right shape, doing, let's say, the artistic part. It wasn't really science. So I was playing with the line angles. What I mean by line angles is the transition lines between the buccal surface and the proximal to copy the shape of this tooth onto the other central and uh, i added some composite on the lateral incisor to try and widen it as much virtually so by moving the line angles to the lateral uh, of the tooth you create a virtually wider tooth she then approved that. I showed her on a mirror. I said, what do you think? Okay, the, co the, 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 the shade that I used was completely wrong, but um, uh, it was just an exercise for the shape of the teeth. She says, fantastic. My upper left one is longer. 
my upper left two is wider. Okay, she didn't use that terminology, but you know what I mean. Um, she says, that's what I want. So this bottom picture now became my wax up, if you will, my uh, outcome that I want to achieve. So I took an index um, of her teeth as they are on the bottom picture, which is my pre-op index. This is the shape of the final provisionals, if you fast forward. So then I prepared her teeth um, for ceramic veneers. And on the bottom picture, you can see the preparations, which were facial, um, facial veneers uh, that were wrapping into the proximal. And the above picture shows you the provisional restorations. These are base acryl composites which were a replica of my mock-up, of my little trial smile, if you will. This is the picture of the final ceramics. So on the upper left one and two, these nicely uh, complement the ones on the upper right one and two. Is that lateral still skinny compared to this one? Absolutely, it is. But it's as wide as it can get. It's better than before. So all the aesthetic planning was done on the mock-up and the actual provisionals. The difference between the mock-up and the provisional, it means that we have committed to treatment. The mock-up is just a kind of a test drive. The patient can pull back. By the time you've got provisionals on, the, the teeth have been prepared. There is no way back. Let me bring the functional aspect into this um, also, because um, as a prosthodontist, I get to deal with a lot of functional cases, not just cosmetic. So this 50-year-old uh, chap had um, moderate to severe erosive tooth wear. You can see uh, the amount of exposed dentin. His concern was that, hey, my teeth on the left are much shorter than the teeth on the right. Um, this case was not purely erosive, there was an element of attrition because what he liked doing is he liked grinding his teeth and he kept going to the left, going to the left, going to the left. So hence, he caused quite a bit of wear of his upper left one, two, three, and the incisal plane looked slanted rather than horizontal to his eyes. So I did a mock up. I took impressions of his teeth. I asked my lab to do what we call a diagnostic wax up, which is like a blueprint, a prototype. And then I transferred this um, mock up into the mouth with this acryl composite. So the top picture is the full smile. And this is more of a relaxed kind of smile. And he then gave me the thumbs up. I like it. That's what I want. Let's do it. So this was part of a consent process. So as I tell my postgrads, the case is now complete. I have um, completed the diagnostic dilemma. I'm watching a lot of Dr. House lately, so I'm kind of uh, influenced by him that uh, there's no more enigma to this case. That uh, all we have to do now is execute the dentistry. You can do the dentistry in composites. You can do the dentistry in crowns or ceramics it doesn't really matter but this mock-up just tells you where you want to go so um i then prepared his teeth he wanted something long lasting so we went for ceramics so i've given him five or six linked provisional crowns and because i knew he was a grinder if i put my mouse originally when he presented, his teeth were there. So I'm adding about two millimeters of length because his incisal plane was slanted. I made the teeth longer and now they're all level. But I wanted to see what he's gonna to do to them because Braxists will keep Braxing. Nobody can stop them. And whoever says that they can, they haven't treated the Braxist. So I put him on his provisionals and I was checking what we call excursions. So he was going back and forth and I wanted to see multiple teeth touching, which I did. So all four incisors were touching in protrusion as he was going back and forth. But this guy was not going forwards. He was going right and left. So 
when he go to the, when he went to the left, he could feel that his canines were clashing against each other, and he told me that hey, my teeth are jamming; they're just coming into each other's way, which meant to me that I had increased the length a bit too much. I had overdone it. So I kept him on provisionals for several weeks, which is the value of the provisionals, um, until he gave me the thumbs up that he's comfortable to eat, that he likes the aesthetics without the temporaries breaking or loosening. So I adjusted his upper left three um, until I could get uh, an even guidance. So you can see from the staining that this is uh, been already there for probably a few months and uh, I adjusted that upper left three, gave him the guidance that should be there. This is now a duplicate of his temporaries. I took an impression from his mouth and I duplicated his temporaries on a stone model. And this now is what the lab needs to replicate. I want the length of this to be exactly the same. I want that to be exactly the same. I don't want any initiatives from the lab's perspective. So these are the final ceramics. Um, that canine is a bit longer than this, but I worked out functionally that I cannot make this upper left three any longer. Otherwise, he was going to break it up. Let's talk about the single tooth, at least the way that I do it. I just want to go through the sequence of how to make a single tooth temp. So this is how my um, temp guide looks. Um, I don't know what you are being taught in different universities, maybe alternate, maybe all sorts of things, but I use silicon putty uh, with the relevant light body. So for a single tooth, you do not need a full large impression to get your temporary guide. You just need one or two teeth on either side. So I'm prepping the six, and I want a bit of the seven, maybe the eight, and the four and the five. That temp index, it just needs to have enough locating features, because the minute you prep the six, that's not gonna help it go back in. So what is gonna help it stay in place is the adjacent teeth, the four and the five, the seven, and a little bit of the buccal tissue and palatal. So I will take this patty index on a sectional tray, something like this, which only goes into half of the mouth, or this fella for anterior cases. And um, I used fast setting patty uh, intraorally, uh, so that I don't have to wait for a full four minutes. You can see that the, the light board silicon goes right into the embrasures so that I don't have a very fat temporary. I don't want to have to cut the temporary forever. So what I do with this temporary guide is I make a V-shaped notch. Why do I do that? If you think about it, you have that uh, temporary guide for a crown on an upper six or a non it doesn't matter. And um, you're prepping it, you're shrinking the tooth down by 30-40% and uh, then you fill this up with some bisacral composite. Whenever we fill something up, we as dentists have a tendency to put more than we need. We expect excess to just flow. Well, the way this is, the excess has nowhere to go. It has nowhere to go. So if you put enough bisacral volume onto this, but more volume than you have actually prepared, the excess will just go, some will go to the seven, some will go to the five, some will go to the buccal tissue, some will go to the palatal tissue. And what you're gonna end up with is a temporary which is high in occlusion because the excess has nowhere to go. So my little V-shaped notch creates a vent, a relief, area so that the excess comes out from here and you can see that there is no excess going onto the five or the seven or at least there is very minimal the purpose of this is to have the occlusion pretty much correct on my provisional just because the excess flows out in just one spot 
We'll then put that in, uh, in hot water to make it set faster because the full setting time um, for this is five minutes and I just can't be bothered to wait. So this is how it's going to look when I take it out. It's going to have this wing um, of, of base acryl, which I just snap off with my fingers. Okay, there's a little bit of flash here, there's a little bit of flash there, but it's very minimal. So, excuse me. If I take a close-up picture, this is how the provisional is going to look from the fitting surface. It's going to need adjustment. Um, in your phantom head courses, you were all playing around with these. I was teaching phantom head for, well, I've done it for 10 years now. Um, so I've spent a lot on these uh, plastic teeth. Uh, um, so if you look at this, it has the wrong shape. You look at that provisional from the fitting surface and it doesn't look like a tooth. It looks uh, concave, whereas it should be the opposite. This is how it needs to look. So we have to do quite a bit of adjusting in all this uh, excess of acrylic, um, excess of this acryl to get it to look right. So what do I prefer using for this? Discs. This brand is called OptiDiscs from Care. Um, the ones that we do use at uh, King's, guys, whatever, is um, uh, Soplex discs. Um, God knows what you have in your own universities, but they're all discs, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and my preferred um, coarseness is, oh come on, is uh, the second from the end. This is too coarse. You can actually see how gritty it is, it's too aggressive. So this is uh, aggressive enough, but it's not going to annihilate my provisional. So I will show you the three angles that I use the discs to get the shape right. This is the occlusal surface of my provisional that I showed you before. And what you can see here on the MB cusp is a big fat bubble and a tiny little bubble on the distal buckle cusp. You always get bubbles, you cannot avoid them. Um, this is the labial view, and um, that doesn't look right. It doesn't look like a tooth. It drops down vertically. What I will then do is I will take a little pencil mark or some sort of a marker, and on the proximal surface, I will make a little fat dot. This is the contact area. This is where the six needs to touch the seven. So imagine the two molars being like this. That's where they're touching that area should not be adjusted because if you adjust that, you create an open contact. What does the open contact mean? Food trapping, possible movement of the abutment um, and gingival irritation. So that area, I don't want to touch it. So I mark it. I will then go and do my three angles. This is the vertical look of the provisional which I don't want to have it I want to create that rounded look because that's the natural emergence of a tooth that's what gives space for the papilla so the first angle I'm going to use is that I'm going to position the disc at let's say 30 degrees or so to give it the right emergence right onto the margin the second angle that I'm going to do is uh, make that from a concave to a convex shape. So I will do a little bit on the palatal aspect and a little bit on the buckle in order to get that to be concave. The third angle has to do with the incisal embrasure. So we're looking at the tooth from the palatal aspect, that's the occlusal, and I will position the disc over here to um, get rid of any sharp bits. This is how the proximal looks at the end of my adjustment. I haven't touched this. I did start initially at the bottom by positioning the disc at an angle. I then did the buckle and the palatal. And finally, I did the incisal embrasure to create a tooth-like shape. So, this is the same provisional with the distal side adjusted 
and the mesial not adjusted, just to show you the contrast. So that's much more anatomical. Sometimes we can overdo it and we can open up the contact, but uh, we can use flowable composite to reclose it. But that shape is wrong. What I then want to do is I want to put this back in the patient's mouth, but this acryl will always leave little bits of debris on the fitting surface. So there's all, forget the hair. <laughs> the hair shouldn't be there because this was actually not a clinical case. I was uh, over lockdown. I said, let me go into the clinic and just mess about on a stone model. So uh, this acryl will always leave little pearls of uh, material left in there. And if you leave this behind, you're trying to put your crown in, and these are going to hit against the abutment. So it's going to raise it. It's not going to let it sit down. So I take an excavator or a perioprobe or um, a flat plastic like here, and I will clean up the internal surface just to remove any, any bits of excess. And then I will sit this down. So it's discs first, clean up the fitting surface, and then it goes in the mouth. If you don't do your proximal um, adjustments, this is not going to sit back in the mouth. It's just the undercuts are there, the, con the, the, the convex look as opposed to concave is not going to let it go back in the mouth. So disc first, proximal reduction. Second is to clean up the fitting surface and then it goes against the tooth and you have a look and you say, hmm, it doesn't fit very well over here. I need to sort that out. But uh, you also look at the proximal surface and that looks quite good and anatomical, but the distal I haven't really done it that well. So it's more of a vertical drop and uh, an acute change. So I need to do that to it. I need to adjust more in here. And you know why I need to do that? So that it's cleansable. What do we ask people to use? dental floss and interdental brushes. Well, if we have all this excess material in here, they're never gonna be able to clean, especially with the little bottle brushes, the teepees as we call them. So uh, cleansability is very important. But what I wanna sort out next is the marginal integrity. So I will use a flowable composite. This is actually a material which is identical to my uh, uh, bisacryl tube. Um, it's called the Luxa Flow, uh, but you can use any restorative composite in a flowable format. And I will, oh, come on. I will place the tip of my flowable um, syringe onto the margin, exactly where I want to add. And I will place a little blob of that. And then I will sit the temporary crown against it. What I'm not gonna do is I'm not gonna put the flowable on the actual crown and put it in. That's the wrong way to do it. Because if you do it like this, you're ending up cementing your crown. It's like putting it on for good. It's not gonna come out. Whereas uh, if you put it on the actual tooth and sit it down, that makes more sense. So I'm gonna sit down my provisional. And as I said before, we always use more than we need because we're dentists. So there's gonna be some excess. So I'm gonna use a straight probe or a scaler. Um, like a sickle scaler, and I'm just going to move this around until it's uh, covering the exposed margin, the open margin, and then I will cure that. Um, when you're doing this part on phantom head, the flowable always stays on the plastic tooth. It's very annoying, but in reality, it uh, it sticks to yeah, it sticks to the bees acryl. So I will then take this out and modify it with some discs, and you can see that it's a little bit rough, but I've got a very good adaptation on the margin. I haven't done the mesial or the distal, I just did that for demonstration purposes. It's still a little bit rough, but it's getting much better. What I will then use is something which is dirt cheap, and I introduced this to Gaia's Hospital, is what is called an Abbott Robinson brush is like a goat, goat hair brush, it's like a, a, a polishing brush. Um, it usually comes for a straight hand piece, but it can come for a slow hand piece as well. 
um, my students, my undergrads at King's, uh, they kind of use these for phantom head, but they're not available in the clinics. I use this at a very low speed, 5,000 RPMs. Now, you don't know what 5,000 RPMs are or 6,000, but it's that slow that you can actually put the, the, the brush on your finger and it's not uncomfortable. It's like just about spinning ring. It's really, really slow. This is the version on a latch grip, on a slow handpiece, um, and that uh, brush polishes beautifully composites and provisionals because provisionals are composites at the end of the day. These are the two kits that I personally use to uh, adjust my provisionals. So these are silicon points and some uh, uh, brushes and buffs. So I get this from America, from Spear Education, and this is from Basil Mizrahi here in this country, um, which is an excellent kit. So this is my provisional after I have done my gold hair brush. I've just polished it a little bit more. The fit over here is good and the mesial I haven't bothered with it. But what do I want to do next? I want to make it really shiny. So why don't we use a bit of bond? Okay, this is the bond that I use in practice. It's Clearfield from Curaray. God knows what you use in your own universities, but one could think that, all right, I'm gonna take a little bit of bond, I'm gonna paint it on my provisional, and I'm gonna cure it, and it's gonna look shiny. It's gonna be fantastic. Well, try that next time you do a provisional. Yes, it makes it really shiny, but afterwards, just take your finger and smear it off, try and just uh, smear it on the provisional, and you will see that it will come off. It doesn't, it's not the right chemistry. It doesn't stay. It doesn't stay as well. Trust me, I've tried everything. So the right materials for that are some glaze materials. I don't want to go into the chemistry because I'm going to bore you to death. Um, but these are um, materials which are intended to give a glaze on the provisionals and uh, without it coming off. I also have a picture of some color effects because if it's an anterior case, I might want to kind of go the next step and add a little bit of chromatization here and characterization. So how do I cure the glaze? Curing light, the standard dental light, will take a long, long time to set the glaze. So this is a picture that I took, and you know what this is? It's a 20 pound product from Amazon. Okay, I don't want you to go and get this and use it in clinic because your tutors are going to hunt me down and they're going to cut my head off. But um, maybe for when you qualify, you can uh, get something like this um, from Amazon. This is what I use. It takes 30 seconds and it cures the glaze. This is what is used in nail salons, which is what they use varnishes. So it's the same chemistry. But the dental curing light is much slower. Why? It has to do with the frequency of the, the, the wavelength of the light. This is my provisional after I have glazed it. Not only I have glazed it, but I've added a little bit of chroma to the neck. I've added a little bit of the yellow stuff um, to reduce the, the value because teeth right up on the neck, they're always a little bit darker. And if you want to be super fancy, if you want to be super fancy, you can go ahead and put surface colorants on the occlusal surface. Okay, for an upper six, who cares? But um, for a central incisor, you may want to put your artistic touch and do all sorts of fancy things. Have a look at the surface texture on the outer surface. No matter how much you polish your restorations, you're not going to get that luster unless you glaze it up. So just to reinforce the point of glazing, um, which is something unlikely for you to guys be able to do at uni unless you speak to your tutors. These are two provisionals that I made. Um, okay, the margins are all over the shop, but um, this is how they look, um, uh, just polished. They don't have the natural glaze, do they? 
this is what I meant earlier, that natural teeth are darker on the neck than they are at the bottom. So after about five, seven minutes of me playing around with these, I made them to look like that. These are provisionals. They stayed for about a month. I added a bit of chroma here. I added a bit of a fissure stain, like a darker stain interproximally. Bless her, this lady is in her mid seventies and she just wanted her two front teeth and she doesn't want the makeover. Um, and I glazed them up, I played with the line angles and then I told my lab, listen, have a look at these. I want you to better these. And obviously, he had found it a bit tricky because um, I went to extreme lengths to make the temporaries really good. Um, for those, oh, come on. For those who are going to be interested in the digital world of dentistry, you're going to be doing this yourselves in um, the final restorations. So I've been using Serac Dentistry for 13 yeah, 13 years now. So I'm making my own ceramic crowns, um, not provisionals, the final ones, like teeth in a day kind of thing. And um, I'm glazing and staining my own crowns. So I put a little bit of a fissure stain, a bit of uh, blue violet on the cast tips to make them more translucent. And uh, that's something that is done in the digital world. So if we can do it for CAD CAM, why not do it for the provisionals? Okay, it's just a few weeks, but it's going to make you a much better dentist. Just going to touch a little bit on the bridges. Um, you must have made some um, provisional bridges, or maybe you're in the process of making some provisional bridges uh, during Phantom Head. And um, what you want to aim for is that V shaped um, embrasure between Pontic and Retainer. So, this is a picture that I took. I wasn't happy with my lab because they gave me the bridge was as flat as a pancake on this area. So you know what this V-shaped notch is for? This is for a little interdental brush to go in. And that's where the patient is going to clean. That's how teeth are. They've got these little black triangles, uh, uh, well, not black triangles, but they've got these triangles in between them where the papilla goes. So that's important for cleaning. So that was unacceptable for me. I send it back for them to modify this zirconia bridge uh, but um, for the provisionals the way we um, uh, it's best to do this at least the way i teach my people at, uh, at king's is to take a flame shape composite finishing bear the yellow band one and just run that bacolingually and that will create a trough automatically which is going to make it um, easy to clean. So that temporary bridge here is not completed. It's a bit rough here and there, but it's got this nice V-shaped notch. You don't want to trap the papilla. You want to give a freedom for the uh, bottle brushes, the little TP brushes. Quickly, a case of implants. Uh, um, I know you haven't done any. You may have done a little bit of training on dental implants. Um, I'll quickly brush through these. The one on the left here is a healing abutment. It's like a lid of the implant. And the upper right one is a conventional crown prep. So we were aiming for an implant crown and a dental crown. But can you see that the gingival margin on the tooth is at this level, whereas on the implant is over here. Well, I want both to be over there. So I'm using a provisional to modify the tissues around the implant to mold the tissues. If you look at it from a vertical perspective, this is my prep and this is uh, impression coping. This is a way to transfer the positioning of the implant to the adjacent teeth. For the laboratory and what um, I don't want is I don't want the gingival zenith of the implant crown to be lower than of this so I want to push this up so I fabricate an implant provisional crown this is made out of composite so the picture on the left is a model of a replica of the implant what we call an analog um, onto which the provisional is made. 
in the design of this provision, you can see that huge kind of CJ, that a natural emergence. It's going to be pushing. You can see how much trauma blanching it causes to the tissues because it pushes it out. Well, you leave that for a couple of weeks and it comes to normal because tissue just responds um, to the pressure. And then when I take the provisional off, I have shaped my uh, peri-implant tissue exactly the same I wanted. So look at the gingival margin here. It's level with uh, the, the other side. And then I will put my impression coping. This is the, the gap between the impression coping and the current tissue is how much movement I created, how much displacement of the tissue I created, quite a lot. Um, and then I will inject some flowable composite. I don't want to confuse you now with this. I will transfer this into the lab, get the final um, impressions taken for my um, ceramics, and these are the final result. Okay, it's very fresh because it's just been cemented, but um, after a bit of healing, this looked stunning. Now, cementing provisionals. You've made your beautiful temp. Um, you've gone through your adjustments and you've polished it and it looks awesome. It looks as good as the final crown you're going to get. How do you put this on? Because you, you have a balance between putting it firmly enough so that it doesn't fall off, but also you have to think of yourself of how you're going to remove it. So uh, it's easy to think, well, we're going to put a super strong cement. If you put a super strong cement, you're never going to be able to remove it in a million years. You're going to have to cut it. And cutting it is not fun because you may damage the abutment. So we've got to get the balance right of putting it on strongly enough to stay for a number of weeks, uh, but also for us to remove it easily. And Tembond is the material which is at the middle of this balance because it's kind of got a bit of retention um, but it's also soft enough to remove it easily. It's very good about thermal and bacterial insulation. <clears throat> it's, um, it's okay to clean up. It's, it can be a little bit messy. Um, it uh, works well for full coverage. You need mechanical retention. So for onlays, this is not going to work. You need uh, the friction of a full crown. Um, because it's quite opaque, those of you who have used Tempont, you will know that it's like Tipex White. It works beautifully to cover dark preps, not darn preps, but dark preps. Um, and on the day of fitting, it's fairly easy to clean from your prep. If um, you want something, uh, let me make that point because it's quite important. The, uh, when you cement a crown, this is how Tempont looks. It's like super bright. Um, when you're cementing um, a crown with tempon, you should not aim to clean up the excess early on before it's set because it's still a bit creamy, it's still a bit runny if you will, and you end up just pasting it all over the place and it's a mess. It's like you're spreading butter on toast. So you wait for that to partially set, you just poke it with a perio probe and when you feel it's being plasticized, you remove it horizontally with a perioprobe or a scaler. And um, ideally you want to put an interdental brush to clean the proximal. If you're struggling for mechanical retention, let's assume you're doing an onlay, gold or old ceramic, whatever, and you don't have um, the taper and the mechanical friction of a crown. Well, then you need something stronger. You need something sticky. Polycarboxylate cement is the answer. So two brands is either Poly F or Durilon. This is partially adhesive. So in the in the um, um, spectrum of cements, you have your tampons at the beginning, then you have your polycarboxylates, um, zinc phosphate before that, plus ionomers and resin cements. That's all your cements done. Um, so polycarboxylate has been there for donkey's years. It's partially adhesive. It will uh, help for unretentive preps. 
onlays, veneers, things like that. Um, but it's quite tough to remove because it sticks to the tooth. If we're talking about veneers, um, uh, one technique of making them is do a bit of etching on the surface of the tooth, not the whole surface, because if you do the whole surface, then you'll never be able to get them off. Um, so just a little bit of spot etching and then making your provisional veneers and cementing them with flowable composite. Another alternative to the spot etched is, oh come on, why is it doing this? Is the shrunk fit where here you can see half the provisional is ready and the other half is going to be done kind of a uh, freehand. This is not bonded, it's just shrunk into position and it locks in in the uh, embrasure areas. How does the patient clean the provisionals? Well, they need to. Um, so what I do to ensure that they are cleansable is I take a periodontal probe and I insert it from the papilla horizontally and that should be going all the way through. Okay, the thickness of the period probe is probably more than the thickness of an interdental brush, but uh, the patient needs to be able to clean these. So we need to keep that concave shape for cleansability. I ask them not to floss, but if they know about flossing, I will I tell them to just get the floss down for a lower temp, but then not go up. Because if they go up, they might catch the temporary and off it goes. So if they're a flossy person, I'm not. If they're a flossy person, they take the floss down and then pull through. So when it hits the gingiva, you just pull through and this is not going to flick the temporary off. I keep doing this more and more. Anyway, removing the temps. The patient has been with the temp for a couple of weeks. They've cleaned it. You've made it beautiful, happy days. Then you have to remove it. So what I actually use to remove mine is uh, the pointing end of the middle forceps. I don't have a picture here. I've got these um, kind of hemostat kind of uh, pliers, which are rarely needed. So an excavator, pardon me, an excavator or a middle forceps. So um, not middle forceps, sorry. What am I talking about? Mitchell's trimmer. <laughs> that is completely wrong. Miller forceps is the holder for articulating paper. Very hell, embarrassing. So um, a Mitchell's trimmer is the instrument that is kind of uh, uh, pointing triangle on one end. It's quite sharp and scoopy on the other end. And uh, I use the sharp end to find a little ledge. No matter how good your provisionals are, you will always find the ledge, always. Even if I spend 30 minutes on it, I will always find the ledge. So you're going to have a little ledge. You find that ledge. You position your instrument here, go upwards, and that is going to lift it up. I don't like a uh, flat plastic for this because it's too thick. I want something pointing. So excavator or um, Mitchell's trimmer. Definitely not wheel forceps. That's a big mistake. The last solution, if it doesn't come off, is to cut them off with a burr, but that is quite aggressive. Um, the polycarboxylate, the polyethylene, it will stick to the tooth and it will probably require an ultrasonic and possibly local anesthetic. Tambond is a piece of cake to remove. That's the last slide. These are the three things that I would like you to remember, um, at least for your undergraduate um, years, to uh, think of making a little v-shaped notch for your pat index which stops just at the start of the tooth and that will allow the excess to come out i prefer to do this in silicon with light body because it picks up the detail and i don't have to faff around with the temporaries well i still faff around with the temporaries because i want to make them super pretty so i use these abbott robinson brushes so once you route um, of uni and uh, you start doing your own work, you can invest in buying something like this to use in practice and it's gonna up your game of provisionals to a very high standard because patients appreciate that and it's gonna make you a better dentist. That's me done.
These are my contact details on the bottom of the screen. If you have any uh, thing that you want to ask me at a later date, but um, I haven't kept contact with with the, with the, with the chat, so I'm open to questions. Drop me an email um, or a DM on Instagram, and I'll be happy to uh, respond. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Thanks very much, Dr. Costas. Very insightful chat. I, I always say, um, I mean, I have one big weakness. I cannot do short presentations. I'm just uh, totally unable. So if that was a problem today for your future speakers, tell them, listen, you have a time limit. But I'm just, it's impossible for me. So sorry about that if it went on for a little bit longer. But um, no, no. No, we learned a lot, learned a lot, especially where it was nice to see you touching on materials and stuff. It's something that we feel it's, it's difficult to get your head around sometimes. So it was nice to hear that. And especially uh, putting bond on my uh, provisionals because Dr. Shu Park's not here. So he's going to think I'm doing excellent provisionals when I'm on clinic next time. <laughs> Give it a bit of a shine. <laughs> Um, so I have a look at the questions or you want to fire them to me? Yes, I, well, I think you touched on it towards the end. We had a question at the start asking us, um, so for your clean sealable provisions on bad perio, what is your views on splinting the provisionals? Yes, uh, very good point. So um, let's say that you're doing two teeth adjacent to each other for whatever reason. Um, and let's ignore the fact that it's bad or good perio. Linking the two provisionals is going to be stronger than having individuals. So they like holding hands. They are quite weak. It's just a tiny little thing of plastic. So uh, if, if they are stuck together, it's going to be stronger. But then you have the situation of how cleansable it should be. Um, so I'm very fussy about keeping them cleansable, especially on a perio case. If you're actually, you have a bad perio case, you don't really want to be doing fancy veneers and crowns. You want to sort out the perio first. So that's a logical sequence, but, um, uh, cleansability wins over anything else, but I do like splinting them up rather than have multiple single units because they should be holding hands and they are happier if they're holding hands. It's like uh, my grandpa and grandma, they just walk out together holding hands and they live happily ever after. Bad analogy, I know, but I said it. <laughs> um, how would you provisionalize inlays, onlays? Well, um, again, bisacryl is the uh, material of choice usually. Um, but then you kind of put it on as a little hat, as a non-lay, and it flaps about. It's like nothing to grip it um, with. So you need to use a partially adhesive cement, and polycarboxylate is the best one. Alternatively, you can just put a big blob of glass ionoma, but it's going to take you forever to remove that. You're going to be there like for an hour trying to remove it. So you need something retrievable. And bisacryl um, cemented on with a strong cement is the best option. Yeah. And then we have another question in the chat here. So, uh, firstly, do you cut grooves in the silicon body to get the light body access to flow out, or do you do a one stage technique? Ah, yeah, good point. The, um, I do a one stage technique, which is exactly what I do for my final crown and bridge impression. Um, so uh, I do not create a spacer for the light body to come afterwards. Why don't I like this? Because it takes double the time. Silicons take about four minutes to set and light body takes another four minutes to set. And in a busy specialist clinic where I work, every minute matters. So um, I like a one stage technique where I take the impressions in one uh, setting. There is no evidence to say that the two-step technique is any better. Um, and uh, addition cured silicones are designed for one-step technique. The older type of silicones, the condensation ones, which were shrinking, were more suitable for this. But I'm a one-stage person. 
others um, a two-stage person it's down to the individual does the glaze have a functional purpose to or just aesthetic no it has a functional purpose because as we all know um, smooth surfaces are easier to clean so if it's nice and shiny proximally it's not going to be collecting all sorts of junk plaque food fish whatever so um, uh, uh, 90% 80% is about the looks is I want the patients to go out and be very proud of the provisions I want their husbands wives whatever to tell them wow your teeth look stunning and the patients turn around and say no 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 hang on these are just temporaries so I'm a little bit fussy with provisionals um, any more uh, build us on nicely because there's a certain part is the glaze purely for aesthetics or is there a functional purpose behind it? That's the one I just answered. Probably days. So we'll clear that up. And then we have one more in the chat. For the mock-up composite trial, do you leave the composite on until you're ready to move on onto the provisionals? Might be the next appointment or do you remove it and send the patient back? Good. Mock-ups. I can talk for three hours about mock-ups until you all drop dead. Um, uh, it's a, a concept that came out of Turkey 15 years ago, and now everyone pretends to be the inventor of mock-ups. Um, so I went at source over in Istanbul to learn about it. And the point of a mock-up is to try something on while the patient is there, and it's meant to stay on for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, um, for the patient to see it and then flick it off. Sometimes the patient asks me, actually, can I take this home as if it's like a jacket um, and, 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 and wear it to show my partner? And I say, OK, fine. But um, I don't really fancy people um, having to remove bees acryl from the teeth because they're going to it's going to get messy. So on some occasions, if it's already planned, I will um, lock the mock up in place so that it's kind of uh, staying. Because if it's just touching and it doesn't have any grip, I mean, they're going to have a bit of water and it's going to come off. So most of the times, this is just for while in the surgery and I remove it myself. But um, if they tell me that I want to go home with it to think about it a bit more, I will um, modify it to make it uh, uh, shrink. And then it's kind of a, a trial smile to take home with you. <laughs> There we go. So I think that's that's the end of our questions, unless we have any more Good. popping up. But Good. no, I think I think it was covered very well today. It's very very insightful, very helpful. I, I go a bit deep. Sorry, I'm not good at waffling, and I'm not good at just superficial stuff. I go straight into deep waters. Sorry if it was a bit too much for your first day. <laughs> but uh, the, the the others might be a little bit more relaxed in their approach. So I just dive deep. Sorry. No, no that's right. We enjoyed yeah, it. That's great. Yeah. Good. Um, no, any great. feedback that may come your way, please let me know, guys, in the next few days. I was really happy to do this. I'm happy to share what I know and I've learned over the years and uh, looking forward to do some more in the future. Thanks very much. Sure, Hope to have Thank you back you. soon. Yeah. Absolutely. There we go. Yeah.